Go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah the ninth chapter. Isaiah chapter 9. And um, we are in the Christmas season, obviously. It says Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people, that walked in darkness have seen, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them, the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and has uh, and not increased the joy. They joy before they, uh, before they according to the joy in the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but it shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And to, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Hallelujah. And then Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, let's look over at Luke chapter 1. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent forth from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin and a spouse to a, uh, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and the angel came in unto her and said hail thou art highly favored the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and when she saw him she was troubled and his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and, shalt, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord himself shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto him, Angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her that was called bearing. Barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So here we have uh, two Old Testament and then a third New Testament prophecy uh, concerning the birth of Jesus. Notice in Isaiah it says that there, was, that, that there would be no more gloom for those in distress. Hallelujah. And I, I thank God that, that God is faithful to bring us out of gloom. Can you say amen? amen. And that there would be joy. Oh, hallelujah. There would be joy. You know, there's, there's, there's times of sadness. Things happen in people's lives and there's gloom, there's despair, there's sadness. They even wrote a hee-haw song about it called Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. 
Uh, not the most faith-filled song you'll ever hear. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it does represent where people get in life. They get to where there is no joy. They get to where there is no happiness. They get to where there is uh, no hope. They come to a place often time where it's, it's just sadness and sadness and sadness and darkness and despair uh, where there is no joy. And, uh, and it wasn't because Mighty Casey struck out. Um, you know, remember, remember that, that poem, you know, Mighty Casey has struck out. Uh, Mudville, he, he was supposed to be the home run hitter and he struck out and they didn't win. So there was, there was no joy in Mudville. Well, I tell you, people, people can have everything around them that's right. They can have all the money they need. They can have everything going as far as the world is concerned, perfect and, uh, and, and wonderful and still not have joy. Because see, joy, what God talks about, and joy that God speaks of, and the joy that he referred to in Isaiah would not be a joy of human um, um, emotion uh, brought about by the proper circumstances happening because everybody, everything was just hunkadory, you know, the old term hunkadory. It would be a joy that was birthed out of something greater. Joy that would come because the spirit of man and the soul of man had received something and, and, and walked, walked in something. Look back over Isaiah, if you will. Um, back over in Isaiah chapter 9. Come on, pages, pages. They're not stuck together. Anyway, um, this is in the verse that says, The people that walked in darkness has seen a great light. And upon them that dwell in the, uh, in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the, hath the light shined. Makes you think of that, uh, the scripture of the New Testament when talking about the birth of Jesus. It says, and when they saw the light, they rejoiced with great joy. Amen? They rejoiced with great joy. You notice here it says, that they, you know, they, 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 the great light is shine. And this says, thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy, the joy before thee, according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Listen, in other words, it's not a natural. It's not because of, because of natural things. He says, for thou hast broken the yoke of the burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Right. For unto us, you know, in verse 5, he talks about some other things. Then verse 6 says, for unto us a child is born. So the joy that was going to come through, through Jesus coming into the earth would not be a joy that people rejoiced of because they got a, you know, a new car, got a raise, got more money in the bank. Hello? This joy was going to come because unto us a, a child was born, a son was given. Joy is going to happen because God had broken the yoke of burden and the staff off the, uh, of the oppressor off of the shoulder of man. A joy of the liberty of the human spirit to be reconciled to God. Hallelujah. You know, we all know this. Uh, joy can end real quick over new stuff. Now, now when I was about, oh, let me think now. I got to think back. Um, I set my stool up wrong. Excuse me. If I don't set it up right, it's, not, it's, it's, it's really uncomfortable. Y'all be looking for for Pastor Ed a new stool. I went, <laughs> Hallelujah. There we go. That's better. Just, we'll do anything. Put it on the internet, won't we? Hallelujah. But uh, go out and buy a new car. Go buy a brand new car. Boy, you're happy. You got joy. Go out to the mall and let somebody ding it. You can you know you can lose your joy real quick. I mean, you can lose it. How, how many know what I'm talking about? You know, you got, there's all that joy about that new car. You could, I mean, the day you buy it, somebody could ding it and you could lose your joy. But the joy that he's talking about here wasn't going to be about like a new car where it could be taken away just because somebody dinged it. This is a spiritual joy because the, the uh, yoke has been burnt, the, burnt, the yoke has been destroyed or broken off your back. The raw, the oppressor has been taken off of your shoulder. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then, why? Because the son was born. The child was born. The son was given. And we have a name called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then it says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Now, I'm saying governments carry authority. Hallelujah. He's going to carry authority. And the authority that Jesus would, would, whether we know into it, and it goes on, it says here, and upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish with judgment and with justice. And from henceforth forever, uh, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. Amen. And so, um, there will be a government established by the wonderful, the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. There would be no end to that government. There would be no end to that authority that comes from that government. And establish in the heart of man to have authority to live above the, author above the, the power and the uh, hand of the taskmaster Satan to live in victory, to live in, in freedom, spiritual freedom, reconciled to God. Hallelujah. Because of the child that was to be born. And the great light would shine upon the hearts of man. Amen. Even those who are living in the land of the shadow of death, that light would shine on them. Glory to God. When you're living in darkness, living in gross darkness, living in defeat, when the light shines, it's a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. Amen. Said amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's look over in Luke chapter 2 now. Luke 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world shall be taxed. I'm telling you right now, they're tax they're taxing and something's been going on for centuries. Millennia. Always wanting somebody wanting to take your money and use it somewhere else. Amen? And, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Not only did they want to tax you, they had to go, you had to go somewhere else to, get, get, to do it. Man, they're going to make you travel just to get, give them the money. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Now, I mean, she went into labor. <laughs> Let's take all that. She went into labor, man. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, you know, a lot of people get, kind of get off on the deep end about, uh, you know, against prophet parity. Jesus didn't have any money. He, they couldn't, he had to be born in the stable. It says that he was born there because there was no room in the inn. Didn't say they had the money to purchase the room for the night. Didn't say they couldn't afford one. Just said there wasn't any room there. You ever been to a hotel? And, 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 you know, I've, been, I've been traveling before. And you're, and you're um, tired and it's late. And you wanted to. And you didn't make reservations ahead of time. I do that all the most time now. I make reservations. But go to somewhere and go walk in. Oh, we're full. And you go to the next one. You're full. Go to the next exit. They're full. And then you start. And finally, what's going on? Well, there's such such events going on. Anyway, well, the, the fact that I had to end up. One time we did it. We had to go ahead and just drive the rest of the way home. I mean, we were exhausted. We, didn't, we just wanted to spend the night, get a few hours sleep, and then finish up the trip. We had to go ahead and drive the rest of the way home because uh, <clears throat> there was some big event going on up in the mountains, and there was just nowhere to sleep. It wasn't because I couldn't afford to sleep. I tried several times to find some place. So they, they tried. There was just no room. Y'all here? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great what? Joy. Great what? Joy. Great what? Joy. Joy. Which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ, the anointed one, the Lord. And this shall be a sign that you, you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And this wasn't prophecy he's going to be lying in the manger. The angel was telling him where to find him. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And actually the, Hebrew, the Greek says, uh, uh, to, the, to, to glory to God in the highest and goodwill towards men of peace. That's what the Greek says. 
Um, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds uh, said one to another, let us go now into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Hallelujah. Now, of course, if you, you read your other gospels, you find out that the Magi showed up, but they, didn't sh they found the young child two years old. He wasn't here. They weren't here tonight. I'm not uptight. If you come by my house, I got a manger scene. I have pictures of manger scenes. I've got uh, nativities. If you want to be uh, upper crust, I got nativities. All right. That, that started out a few about ten years ago. I started ch ch changing it from nativity to nativities. It's like people call dimatap dimatap. Go get over yourself. <laughs> Amen. It's a nativity. It's a nativity. If you, if you, and I tell you, I guarantee you, if you're below the Mason Dixon line, it's a nativity. Amen. Uh, and I got, I got uh, magi in my manger scene, my nativity. Hallelujah. Now, I could you know, put a two-year-old Jesus out somewhere and put him in a house and have, have another setting somewhere else and put the wise guys over there. But, you know, um, it just doesn't work. You can't sing We Three Wise Men of Orient Are and that kind of stuff. Um, but just so we understand, timeline-wise, the Magi showed up about two years later, probably 60 of them, not two. Not, you know, not three, about 60. The, you know, say, people say, where'd the three come from? from? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They showed up with Jesus' dowry for ministry. That was set aside for his ministry. Uh, that, that was God preparing for Jesus to go into travel and to minister um, with that dowry at a later time. But notice the angels appeared in heaven, and the glory, and the glory of the God shone round about them, man, and said, hey, you'll find Jesus, the son of David. Praise God. And uh, they went to find Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. And um, I was looking real quick just to see which gospel had, had the, the, uh, the rest of the, the event so that you, we could get the wise guys in there. They're in there somewhere, aren't they? Hallelujah. And then Matthew chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came um, wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east. And have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with them. And when he gathered the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the priests of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule thy people Israel. And Herod, he had privately called the wise men, inquired them diligently what time the star appeared. And they sent to Bethlehem and said, Go search ye diligently for the young child. Not the babe, but the young child. And when, the, and, when he, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. When they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till they came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Amen. Because they found the place. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and felt, notice something here. Where are they? They came into a house. Jesus was born in the manger. Now they're coming into a house. Hello? And there's a young child there. Amen. And um, when they opened, uh, and, and worship, and, and with the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him, when, when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. There's where the three wise men came from, is from the gifts, not from the number. Doesn't say how many there, but, the, but historically, Magi traveled in caravans of approximately 60. Uh, and being warned of God in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed into their own country. And they were departed. Behold, the, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Amen. And uh, jump down to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. 
And then fulfill the which is spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah, the prophet saying, and Ramah, there a voice went out, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weepeth for her children and would not be comfort, comforted because they are not. Okay, so here, you know, here's where, where we find out that Jesus was about two years old when the wise men showed up. Uh, but because the star appeared, it took the wise men, or magi, two years to get there. When they found him, he was in a house. I say house. Wasn't in the manger. He's in a house. Amen. And then when they, when they, when they went out and killed the children, if, it, if it, oh, he was just born, he was born today, they would kill the babies. But he said they killed them all two years and under, according to that which they diligently inquired. But notice, I mean, that's not, that's not the part I'm after. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. Praise God. Amen. Thank God for the joy that comes from heaven. Why? Because they saw the light. Amen. There's an old song, I'm, I'm, I don't know who else said it, but an old group called the Lanny Wolf Trio used to do a song called, When I saw the light, I rejoiced with great joy. When I saw the light, I rejoiced. When I saw the light, I rejoiced with great joy. I rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Some of y'all may not ever remember that song. <clears throat> Brother Bill Radio, man, do you remember the Lanny Wolf Trio? Don't, no, no, no. Brother Bill don't even remember it. Well, anyway, it's a good song. And we all do that. The light of heaven comes. Glory to God. There is a light that shines on man that comes out of heaven that brings the, the, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He died for our sin to redeem us and the God to justify us. Glory to God. We've been justified by his blood. Glory to God. Can you say amen? And that brings joy to the heart of man. <clears throat> I find it distressing and, 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 and just in, in the sense of, um, you know, wanting people to walk in all the fullness of God that Christians are, are down. Christians are without joy. Christians are sad. And yet the Bible says that the, when, the, when the burden is broken off of the shoulder or the burden is taken off the shoulder and the staff is removed they did that and they had, because that was done they had joy. And the, per, and, and the one that came and removed those things was the son that was born. I mean, the child that was born, the son that was given. It brought joy, not the joy of winning a lottery or having a new car, but a joy out of the heart of man. And yeah, you can have stuff happen that can rob you uh, uh, emotionally, but I'll tell you what, you can just reach down on the inside and there's a joy. I said there is a joy. Peter says, uh, First Peter 1, whom having not seen ye love, and whom thou you see, and whom now... Though you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There is a joy that can sustain us through the most difficult of times. There's a joy that comes from heaven. A joy that comes up out of your spirit. You could have wrecked your brand new car. Your house could have burned down. Three dogs could have got run over this afternoon. And you could still have joy unspeakable and full of your, you know, your three favorite dogs. Now, if I had three cats run over, I would have, I would have joy without the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not a cat fan. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody else? Well, no, I don't want to find out who's not a cat fan out there. Amen. But this joy, this joy came because the burden is removed. The staff of the oppressor, amen, it's broken. His authority over our life is no more. Hallelujah. Can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah. Somebody say double shunda. <laughs> oh, glory. I'm telling you, it's just wonderful to be in a place where the, where the, where the, uh, uh, the authority is saved. That's why the Bible went when it talked about Jesus being born, Emmanuel coming. It said, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. There shall be no end to the increase of his In other words, his authority, once, once Satan was defeated, Jesus would never lose his authority again. 
Amen. And it would increase. Oh, thank God for the increase of the authority. And so Satan can't, Satan doesn't have authority. There should be joy in your house. Satan can't, can't, just can't come and do what he wants to do. Amen. Oh, what joy. Praise God. And as Peter says, he, re he referred to it as joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so God wants us as the church to not live sad. You shouldn't have sad days. Go get rid of Richard and Karen Carpenter's rainy days and Mondays always get me down. If you're still singing that song, get rid of it. And if BJ's Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head is still your favorite song, you need to get rid of it. And start saying, I got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river in my soul. I mean, it's peace and all others, you know, but joy. You can sing it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. Think about that. I'm going to tell you something. The half hadn't been told about your life. The half hadn't been told about what God's done for you. The half hadn't been told about what you're going to walk in. Amen? Come on now. There's joy. There should be joy on the inside. That today, God has an opportunity to show more of himself to you. That tomorrow's coming, and there's going to be more of God for him to show to you. And the next days are coming. But see, most people get going, ah, oh, the day's lousy, tomorrow's going to be worse, the day after that, I just don't know how bad it's going to be. See, that's not the joy of the Lord. You don't have a revelation that the light has shined into your life. You don't have a revelation. The wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace has come and broken the burden off of you and removed the staff of the oppressor from your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout. So you're sitting down. Well, I, I, well I'm sitting down. I'm shouting. You can shout sitting down too. Hallelujah. Joy. 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 Amen. That's what the psalmist saw when he said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. That our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Whereof they said among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Whereof he hath done great things for us. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. Oh, what joy. I'll tell you right now, church, if we would get back to being great, listen, I'll tell you something. And can, can I say this? Where are we are glad. Yeah. The Lord has done great things for us. Where are we are glad. Psalm 126, verses 1 through 3. If we need to get back to an appreciation that we're saved, we're born again. That we've passed from death unto life. We got too many people upset they didn't get a Cadillac. Come on now. Well, I was using my faith that I didn't get something. I'll tell you something. Um, the Bible says that they all you, through, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make all your requests known unto God. I'm going to tell you something. I think a lot of people, the only thanksgiving they give is thanksgiving for an answer to something they want. Instead of having thanksgiving for what God's already done in their life. We've lost sight of having a grateful heart. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a parent... And now you can go to anybody, any parent. There's a point in time <coughs> when, when all the kids, all they want is to you give them something and they lose that grateful heart because they didn't get something new and they have no appreciation for what you've already done for them. That you just say, okay, I've had, that's, that's enough of that. I'm not going to keep giving you and you're not going to appreciate what I've already done for you. 
Well, I've got great faith. I, I don't think you can have great faith without a grateful heart. I believe the people of great faith had grateful hearts. Amen. Grateful to God. Oh, I'm telling you, we need to come back to a place that we can be grateful that Jesus came. You know, remember the story Dad Hagen used to tell? About the woman, you know, she came and uh, early in the morning, he's still in his, I think he's still in his pajamas, bathrobe or whatever, came and she says, oh, I just don't feel safe. Well, why don't, why don't you feel safe? Well, you know, I don't have any joy. You know, I don't, you know, I don't feel saved. And of course, he th he's thinking, I don't feel real saved either. Got me up out of a good, that's what it was, got me up out of a bed, out of a good sleep. If I'm not mistaken in this story, he may, he may have uh, stubbed his toe on the way to answer the door. Amen. You can, yeah, I'm going to tell you something. Pastors are human too. You wake me up at, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I stub my toe on the way to the door just to find out you don't feel saved? I might not feel saved right then. Come on. Hello. And um, I don't feel saved. And he's thinking, well, I don't, what was she, he said, he said, she said, well, what do you do when you don't feel uh, whatever, spiritual, whatever? He, he, he said, well, watch this. He just, he lifted his hand and said, Lord, I want to thank you. I just want to thank you that I'm born again, that I've passed from death unto life, that Jesus is my Savior. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. And just began to go on along those lines. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he began to lift his hands. Thank you that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I speak in other tongues. Oh, and the glory of God's in my life. And you just bless me so much. You're so, your blessings are so rich. The blessings of God upon my life are just so wonderful, so marvelous. Glory to God. The blessings upon my life are, are, are just, and, just and, and all of a sudden, he, uh, uh, he hit a gusher. Just, oh, I began to thank God and worship. And, and, uh, and uh, she, she said, uh, your countenance just changed. Yeah. He said, now you try it. So she lifted her hands. And she'd be, oh, Lord, thank you that I'm born again. That I passed from death unto life. That Jesus came to save me. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Oh, I just want to thank you for the blessings that have gone upon my life. That I'm baptized with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, she hit a gusher. About the same place. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, there's a lot of Christians walk around sad because they haven't spent enough time thanking God. For what he's doing. You don't have to recant how dirty, rotten, sinner you are. Just thank God he saved you. Thank God Jesus came. Thank God he redeemed you by his blood. Hallelujah. Thank God you're washed in the blood. Thank God your name's in the Lamb's book of life and won't be blotted out. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God he sent the Holy Ghost as the indwelling teacher and comforter and helper and stand by and advocate and intercessor. Praise God. Glory to God to live on the inside of you. Praise God. Oh, thank God. That, uh, glory to God that the blessings of God overtake you and that God's already blessed you so much you just don't know what to do with all that he's already done, praise God. And I'll tell you, if we spend more time doing that, you'll have less sad days. I'll tell you why people have sad days. They think about all the bad stuff and they think about all the stuff they don't got. That's bad English, don't they? Isn't it? They don't got they think about all the things that they, they, they wanted and didn't get. But I'll tell you something. If we could get back to, the, to having a heart of thanksgiving, having a grateful heart, being, I'm just telling you. Uh, now, the Bible says this. Now, see, we, we, we avoid this. Prosperity people and even prosperity preachers avoid this. With such things as you, as you have, there with be content. We run from that one. Yeah. Because we don't know what to do with it. Well, that's over where in um, Philippians? Is that Hebrews? Thank you. Where is it, Ron? <laughs> Hebrews 10 or 11. Thirteen five. All right. We got pages have fallen out. Praise God. <clears throat> well, 
let's just look here. There's an exhortation here going on by, by the writer of Hebrews, I believe, whom I believe was Paul. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in body. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation or lifestyle be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I not, will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember then, which had the rule over you, we'll leave that alone. Um, that's another sermon. Notice it said, let your lifestyle be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. Now, here he didn't say you couldn't have things. But I think there's a lot of people who see people getting blessed. And, I'm, and, and some folks, I'm going to have to be real honest with you about this. <clears throat> some of the prosperity teaching has created this atmosphere. <clears throat> Guy walks in and they're, they're, they're wearing $30,000 Rolexes. And they're telling you that if you give to their ministry, you can have a $30,000 Rolex. Or if you give in this service, you're going to have a thousand-fold anointing released on you, and your, your, all your bills are going to be paid off tomorrow. And they're living in $3 million houses and driving, you know, $250,000 cars and got three jets. And, you know, and listen, I'm not against any of this. I, I understand. We as the ministers have to be careful how we present things. And oftentimes, I think we have, we've created, you know, we promise people things. The preachers are walking out of town with the money. The people aren't getting the return, and they begin to covet what other people have. And I'm going to, we, need, we need to, you know, the ministers, we, we ministers need to judge ourselves about these things. We, should, now, we don't back off preaching God's, God's prosperity and how God wants to bless you. But let's, we got to stop making, using that as a, as a means to leverage people for personal gain. And that's a lot of what's happened. And I think we set people up to be covetous. And Paul's exhortation here is to let your lifestyle be without covetousness. And be content with such things. Now listen, does it mean you can't desire to have other things? You can desire stuff without having being covetous. You can desire, like, you know, you could desire a new vehicle without being covetous of someone else who has one. Amen. Do you, you understand that? You can live a life of, of growing in faith and, and advancing and, and, and being content with things you have. Here's where you get into trouble. When you don't have something that somebody else has, you're jealous, you're upset, you get downcast, you lose your joy. So you got into covetousness. You're ungrateful. And the Bible says be content with the things that you do have. In other words, those things should not govern whether you've got joy or not. They shouldn't govern whether you, you have the joy of the Lord and you're, you're happy with God and your life is good because you've got, you got a 1,500 square foot house instead of a 15,000 square foot house. And let me tell you, with the 15,000 square foot house goes the cleaning too. Um, when, uh, when Alan was with us here, uh, he took me on a job site with him he was doing. And it was a house over here in, 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 uh, up, up in the Brashfield area. It's a 12,000 square foot house. They were doing the audio system in it. And the televisions and all the, 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 the whole, they had, this thing had a, had a uh, climate controlled audio video room. It had air conditioning and heat in this room with all the electronics in it climate just a written now the, the walls weren't painted real pretty it was just a sheet was a fire tape sheetrock but they had air conditioning and heat in there to protect all the equipment 12,000 square feet now I'm gonna tell you something I don't want to dust that house there were bookcases galore I mean this you know this this wasn't even finished I mean three car three car detached garage with a walk, catwalk up above with a bedroom room above the garage with a catwalk over to the house. He drove I mean that was a lot of cleaning in the house. I didn't I, you know what? You people believe you get that house, you gotta believe for the maid service to clean it too. Because if you don't, that's a full time job just keeping it dusted. You know? We shouldn't get 
covetous and lose our joy because um, you're invited over to somebody's house and when you walk in, it's bigger than yours, nicer than yours, got more stuff than yours, and you're sitting there going, and I'm doing, I'm tired, and I'm giving, I'm doing everything to do. I'm going to tell you something. If you lose your joy over what you have, or don't have really, you see entered into covetousness. And the Bible says live a lifestyle without covetousness and be content. In other words, there should be a contentment in your heart that all is well. All is good in my life. All is wonderful in my life because Jesus came. Jesus shed his blood. Jesus has redeemed me from destruction. And you know what? I may have a, an apartment or a, I'm living on a, a mobile home furniture in a mobile home. Janie's our first, our first living room set was a mobile home uh, couch and chair um, that the place I was working gave me. And, you know, and listen, that furniture's not high quality. I mean, it's, it's got about a six month shelf life. You know, I mean, it's just not good. It's just not good quality stuff. I mean, you know, they, they, they put, you, you put a $15,000, a 14 by 70 home on there, furniture, furniture. It's, somewhere they're cutting the corners. Let me tell you where they're cutting them. Everywhere. Two by twos. I mean, you know, <clears throat> plastic door handles. I mean, they cut every corner they can cut. And, you know, but you know what? If, you, if that's where you are, don't, you, don't, don't be covetous. Don't be covetous. Be content that you're not sleeping under a, a thatch roof on a dirt floor with, with, a, with a drain, uh, with, a, with a gully through the middle of your floor to run the rain out back out of, of, of underneath there on your sleeping bag. Amen? Be content. In other words, you can be content without having a lot of stuff. Because the joy of the Lord has been, is in your heart. The joy of the Lord rises up in you. The light has shined into your life. That doesn't mean that you can't believe God to come out of there and to go up to another place and to have nicer things. But don't you get covetous and don't you lose your joy because, you know, so-and-so came to the church three weeks ago. They heard one sermon on prosperity and they got a brand new car. You've been believing for three years. They may be some single person with nothing in life to pay for except the car. You might be a family of five. Hello. With less money coming in. Are you here? And your investment's been in your children more than it's been in what car you're driving. Hello. Don't get covetous. Just be content. Keep believing God for the new car that you need. Keep believe, keep your faith out there. But don't let the circumstances of life from other people around you rob you and get you out, out, of, out of contentment into covetousness. Learn the secret. Well, Paul learned it in Philippians chapter 4. And I don't have the 20th century translation here in my Bible, but if you got it up there, you can put it up there. Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul says, um, I, um, Verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you are careful, you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned that whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now here, the 20th century says, uh, do not think that I am saying this under pressure for want, for I, I, however, I am placed, have learned to be independent of the circumstances. The joy of the Lord, the joy that comes from God, can make your life heart, your yeah. He translates contentment as being independent of circumstances. And he goes on and talks about whether he had enough or had little. Whether he, whether he had little or whether he had much. It didn't, it didn't affect him. That wasn't the governing factor of his life. The possessions and what he had. What was the governing factor was what Jesus had done in his heart. Amen? Amen? 
Paul said, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. Thank God we can be independent of the circumstances and find biblical joyous contentment. Why? Because Jesus came. So once again what we need to do is go back and look at the light. We need to see, we, we need to see the star and rejoice with great joy. Amen? I said we need to get back to rejoicing with great joy. Having a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness that we're saved. That the, that the babe in the manger grew up and became a man and, and paid the price for our sin. And stop getting uptight because we gave so-and-so a $40 gift and they gave us a $5 gift card to Starbucks. And did you give to get or not? I mean, what, what's the deal? Hello? Hello? Amen? Praise God. So during this Christmas season, let us be faithful to be independent of the circumstances. Let the light of the love of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shine brightly in your heart. Let the purpose of Jesus be the biggest center and focal point of your Christmas this year. Not whether or not the store clerk says Merry Christmas or not. Uh, the darkness is getting darker. But we ought to be full of joy because we're saved. We know the true meaning of Christmas. We know why Jesus came. Amen? Praise God.